ending on recording every semester. So um, first things first, let me go ahead and introduce myself. So I am Professor Rosen. Hopefully you got my uh, welcome video uh, earlier. If you did not, I'm uh, sorry, but you can find it uh, on the Canvas page, which I, which is probably our most important uh, page to look at. So I'm going to just give a brief overview of the Canvas page if you haven't seen it, and then I'm going to go over like this syllabus and the way things are going to work, and then we'll talk about a bit about the history of computer science, and then we'll be out of time. Um, so, so let's go ahead. So everybody can see my screen with the with my web browser. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just wanted yeah. to make sure I was sharing the right thing. Okay. So. Okay. All right. So. So there's a picture of me, Andrew Rosen. Here's my email, andrew.rosen at temple.edu. Uh, that is one of the many ways to get into contact with me. Uh, below you see the uh, the link to my Zoom. This is the link you will click on to sign up for office hours. Uh, sorry, when you sign up for office hours as well. If for some reason you really, really, really desperately need to reach me, you can text me at my phone number. This is like if, um, this is for emergencies and stuff. I don't, uh, I don't really believe you're going to get an emergency during this um, during this semester, uh, like like because I'm not giving I'm giving quizzes that you take on your own, not exams. So there's no need to like tell me you're not you had a car accident or something. But if there is some kind of emergency, you can let me know. Um, so the way office hours work, note that I didn't bother listing them. Office hours are over here, but they're consistent. Uh, you just simply go ahead and uh, click on this link and you'll be given a selection of days, right? And the way it works is that um, as long as you're signed into a Google account, uh, you'll see what office hours are available. So my office hours are two to apparently, yeah, two to four on, on Mondays, uh, six to eight on Wednesdays, and 10 to 12 on Thursdays. So different, so very different times on very different days. I tried to make it so that I had plenty of time to meet with students. Uh, these are, of course, not the only times I'll meet with you. These are just simply the set times that you can e easily register for me. If you need to meet me at a different time, just send me an email or message me on Discord. Um, but anyway, the way you register, you click, put in your name, you know, it should put in your name over here. Um, and it'll invite you. If you no longer need the office hours, you just simply delete it from your Google Calendar and it will free it up for another student. Uh, you, these are blocks of 15 minutes. So, um, so if, um, and these are just simply times where I will know. It will create a Google Meet link for you as well, but don't use that. It just automatically creates that and there's no way I can change that since I don't administrate the Google uh, Calendar stuff for Temple. But, um, that is just simply the I found I found that this is the easiest because way to do stuff because uh, that way you reserve time for you and you're guaranteed uh, the time and you'd be surprised how much we can get done in 15 minutes. All right, who hates buying textbooks? I do. Everybody. Every one of us. Who right. doesn't at this point? Okay, so good because uh, I won't I won't make you buy a textbook. Um, so the way you're gonna I get us. Uh, so we're, we do have a textbook, but it's free. So uh, now disadvantage, it's electronic. So if you need um, a solid, a, a actual textbook to read for some reason, like that's not on a computer, I have some other resources that I will send you uh, uh, links to, but, but they're no more than 30 bucks a piece. So um, anyway, what you want, we'll be using the book Foundations of Python Programming. You wanna click here, and this is the course, uh, Spring 2021 Rosen. And just simply use that so you get sifted, uh, you know, sorted into the correct course. Um, when you sign up or, and create a user account on, on RuneStone, which is the website that this is hosted on, use your TU email address or your, you know, the name that you have listed on Canvas because um, that will make my job easier when I try to, uh, get the exercises, the graded exercises uh, 
from RuneStone combined with the graded exercises from Canvas. And if I don't have to manually go through and sift like uh, 14 people who didn't do that, then my life is all the more easy, is easier. Next, um, Discord, join the Discord. Uh, click on this, it's just basically a giant chat room. You don't have to use your real name or anything. Although if you have specific questions that pertain to you, you might have to send me your actual name at some point. Um, so, you know, uh, join that and uh, I will see you there. Um, there's different channels and stuff. Here's your TAs. You're gonna click on their links on their respective Zoom links to sign up for their sections. Uh, this is Happy Feet who helps me grade. Um, and uh, on every Tuesday, I'll be running what are called distraction discords. Um, so today included six to eight distraction discord. Well, I'll be streaming whatever I happen to be doing on the computer at the time. But basically, it's a way for us to chill and um, quote unquote build a sense of community. <laughs> um, but in seriousness, it's a way for me to keep engaged with my students and give give me a way for uh, give us a way to basically talk and hang out in a way that we would be able to do in a normal semester, but can't really do here in the constraints of, of the virtual teaching. Okay, so that's all, all the important links. By the way, if you miss a lecture or anything over here, they all get recorded. Just click here, lecture recordings. This is currently the playlist from last semester. I'll keep this up, and but I'll, above it, I'll put the playlist for this semester, right? So. So there you go. All right, so let's go over the syllabus um, now, just simply so that we have ourselves some, you know, sorry, let's see. Is there a TA? There should be a TA for everybody. Um, let's see. So TA section, oh, section six. I don't teach section six. Section six is uh, a different um, is a different professor for an evening class. So okay, um, syllabus goes over the general stuff, but first and foremost, um, as I mentioned in the welcome video, this is a flipped classroom, meaning that I went through, I went and made lecture videos, and the way most classes are going to work is that you watch the lecture videos. Uh, I will get to that the the lab questions. The lecture videos, you watch the lecture videos, and in class, we'll work on projects from the textbook. Um, so basically, we'll be doing a lot of active learning in, in class. This is because your first contact should, with, with the material, it's better if that that's easier stuff. So it doesn't really make sense for me to be there. But for the stuff where you actually will have questions, it makes sense for, for you know, uh, me to, to be there. So um, the virtual lecture time will be used for review in class practice, practical exercises as well as time to work on the homework I assign. Um, so labs are held virtually in the same way as lectures, except for one lab, which is held hybrid. Okay. That hybrid lab, okay, is going to, is basically, that's held in person. Um, but if you feel uncomfortable going uh, going out in person and getting into a space with a bunch of other people for some reason, I have no idea why that might be, uh, then, then uh, I will be holding a simultaneous Zoom session at the same time. So, uh, so and, and that will be streaming with the, with the professor. So that will be, sorry, with the TA there. So uh, you're not gonna miss anything this class can be done completely online, even if you're assigned to the hybrid class. All right. So uh, turning in your uh, homework is a two part process. And by homework, I mean the lab assignments that you'll be getting. Uh, I, so just so basically, there's a two part process, you submit your homework by uploading the appropriate file files to Canvas. Homework is judged late by, based on when you submit it, not demoing it, which is the other process. To demo you homework, your homework, you show it to us during lab or office hours. Um, that's how you get a grade. That's just demoing means you show us your code, you run it, and you answer a few questions about it to make sure you understand what you did. Uh, only one section is hybrid. 
and it will be listed on your and it should be listed uh specifically one of the sections tamara teaches on monday i uh, if you that is a hybrid section um specifically let's see section two is hybrid um so la so i'll get into when what what your meeting times are since there's a lot of sections and they meet at different times okay so uttering some there is one there is one and only one there is one way to instantly fail the course and that is to utter the following sentence or some variation thereof i did not know we needed to demo our assignments to receive credit for them okay i just told you it's over here on the first page don't say that and the reason being is that i would always get some a student who would tell me that at the end of the semester and ever since i put in this clause i haven't had a student tell me that so um this is the wrong code i needed to update that apparently i don't know why i didn't so um yeah and last one uh not wearing a mask to the lab will result in defenestration well sorry no cancellation of the live portion of the lab a vocabulary lesson what does defenestration mean Cancel. tossed out of a window tossed out of a window it's a very specific word isn't it um so all right course details so uh just fyi it's a four credit hour course so that means that um that there are eight to twelve hours of of work each week outside of lecture approximately so that's what it basically the the rule of thumb is one hour one lecture hour is equal to three hours outside of, of the class um could be less could be uh but generally it's around that much so our lecture so you have two lectures and one lab each week except for possibly this week if you're on if you're monday so we meet tuesday and thursday 2 to 3 20 virtually depending on what lab section you've signed up for this is when you meet this is when you meet right so monday at 9 a.m i still another thing i didn't update for fall but uh for switching from fall to spring but basically uh, sections one and two, they meet Mondays at 9 a.m. Um, notice that you can meet vert that if you're on one, it's always virtual. If you're section two, you have the choice of being virtual or going in person. Everybody else, sections three, four, six, and seven. Is it six and seven or is it five and seven? You know what? I'm sure if you're here, you're in the right section. Give me one second. You know, those two keys are right. Six. Yeah. Six and seven. Six and seven are so three, four, six and seven. So I do teach six. Not I guess it's five. I don't teach. OK, so six and seven are all these are virtual. No, you do not have to meet in person if you don't want to. If you're in section two. So this hybrid thing only applies to lab section two. Okay, so lab three, everybody, and even if you're in lab section two, you have the choice of being virtual. I'm not going to force anybody to go anywhere. I'm not going to make anybody do what I wouldn't do myself. Make sense? Okay, so, um, right, we've got prerequisites. You've got to have score to see or better in 1021. Uh, we strongly recommend a laptop or some kind of computer. If you cannot afford a computer, please let uh, meet with me as soon as possible to discuss a, a solution. Right? I can. Your solution can range from two hundred to four hundred dollars. Although the new Raspberry Pi uh, is actually like only a hundred bucks if you've got if you don't if you're okay with that providing your own monitor. So that's pretty cool, and it's actually doable to actually use as a daily driver. So yeah, you can find, so we can find a fairly cheap solution for a textbook for you. Um, ostensibly your minimum internet speed is eight download and five upload. You'll want a webcam and headphones, uh, but okay. You don't necessarily, but this is just simply what I've been told to put on the syllabus. Um, 
textbooks. So again, link to the textbook website. You'll want to use not the fall 2020, but the spring 2021. Um, if you need additional stuff, uh, these are two textbooks I recommend. And you can find them on Amazon or somewhere else for a hard cut. These are both free textbooks electronically. Okay, they're all free. But if you need a hard copy, 20, 30 bucks for a hard copy. Okay, which is fairly reasonable. And these are, again, both really good ones. So um, attendance says it's required. Again, this is kind of stuff that uh, I mentioned. If, if you can't make it because you're uh, for some reason, I I understand we're we're adults here. This life happens, but you know, just keep me in the loop. The more you keep me in the loop, the better you know about stuff you miss. The better I'm able to accommodate you. Okay. Um, I will, it says I'm sup supposed to take attendance. I ain't doing that anymore. I, I tried that last semester. It was a mess. Um, and, uh, if, so I will send you emails though. Um, I, and if you, and it's good to attend the lecture because I am prone to mentioning what is on, uh, what is going to be on the test up to including exact questions. Uh, if for some reason you are in a different time zone, I had multiple students in India, um, Korea, and Japan last year, you know, in previous semesters. So just let me know if you're in an odd time zone. I'll do my best to accommodate you. Uh, if you're having issues because being cooped up in isolation sucks, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Don't hesitate. I'm here to listen to you. I am here to make accommodations for you. I am here to show, tell you about what resources are available. You know, anything you tell me will be private. So disabilities, if you need, if you need uh, extended time or other accommodations, register with TRS if you haven't. I will, work, I will work to make reasonable accommodations and pretty much every accommodation I can think of is reasonable. There are, I have yet to find an unreasonable accommodation. Okay. Um, I will be recording my own lectures. You're more than welcome to record your own, uh, to make your own recording, but you must tell me because I believe two, Pennsylvania is a two, is a two state consent state. So um, official school policy is recording of this class is permitted with the instructor's permission, which you have, but only for personal use. In other words, don't record my stuff and then sell it. That's just not cool. Okay. Um, so letter grades, I'll go over the curve later. But basically, getting a guaranteed a ninety guarantees you an or above guarantees you an A, no matter what the curve is. Getting a B guarantees you a B, no matter what the curve is. You need about a seventy to pass the test uh, class. The DFW rate for this course and similar courses is approximately thirty percent. Um, so just keep that in mind. That doesn't mean thirty percent of the class will fail. That just means like thirty percent of the class gets a D, an F, or they withdraw. And a lot of students just end up withdrawing. Um, so your final grade is built up of these parts. A solo, solo exercises, active learning exercises, no, uh, a final project, quizzes, and a final exam. Notice that the active learning exercises are as much as the quizzes. So let's go in, into depth of what those each mean. Solo exercises are the stuff I assign in the textbook. They're essentially free points for you because it's stuff you can do, you, you'll have unlimited attempts on, okay? Uh, the defining feature of these solo exercises is that they're fairly short, they're targeted, and they're intended to be done with little input from me. You don't need to ask, you shouldn't need to ask me any questions on, uh, on those, right? Um, other than what the due date is. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't ask me for help if you're stuck. If you ever have questions, please reach out. If you have a question, I guarantee five other people do. Okay, um, and you're more than welcome. And even though I say it is intended to be done with little direction from faculty, and it says solo, there's nothing stopping you from asking for help from your fellow students. Okay, these are, but it's worth 10% of the grade. These are just easy stuff that are done through the textbook and gets automatically graded. So, and again, there's kind of an unlimited number of attempts on these. Uh, next, active learning exercises refers to projects or problems or assignments that we introduce in the lecture or the lab. So they're 
we so these are things that are that that you'll be getting like weeklies in in lab they're intended to be started in the lab or in the lecture section we go over these problems me or the ta and typically we'll have a live or recorded walkthrough associated with it and i encourage you getting help from your fellow students um these are the kind of things that we um that you that you need to demo active learning exercises i will state on the canvas what you what needs to be demoed and what does not but if it's on the textbook it does not need to be demoed got it so typically so basically this is non-lab this is lab as well as stuff that happens in lecture make sense um so um we'll also have a final project we did that last semester i plan on giving a uh just to see how that went out i was really impressed with the results um it's your opportunity to basically take what you learn and do something with it i um, as long as you put um, forward a reasonable, and we were and we're fairly lenient with grading the final project. So long as you put forward a reasonable proposal, one that we don't think is like too easy, um, then it's then we're happy to see uh, see what you make. Uh, you can implement it in any programming language that you want, as long as we approve. You're allowed to use anything you want, as long as we can. Uh, as long as we can see what you did. Um, all we're asking is that, you, that your final project is something that interests you or that you solve an actual problem, you make something better for campus or you make something better for the world. Um, the ideal, ideally it's something that you'll come back to that, that's not just dumb for this course, but something that you think is, is interesting enough beyond the course. Um, the if you plan on making a game the the um my guideline is my my metric is if it amuses me for a minute or more then that's then that's then you did an awesome job okay so um and you're allowed to do and other and these paragraphs basically say hey you're allowed to you're allowed to work in groups for your final project, but you know a one person, a two person, a two person project should be twice as much work as a one person project, and a three person group should be three times as much. Um, if you like are a senior or in another class that requires a project, you're allowed to double dip so long as you get uh, for your final project, so long as you get permission from from all the professors who you're doing this project, right? Some professors are not okay with double dipping, like using the same project for two classes. I'm okay with it so long as you get approval from the other professor. Quizzes. So a quiz is an exams. I don't plan on having exams. I do plan on doing on, on quit on doing quizzes. I find I want to try to have a quiz basically every week and a half, so to speak. So um, now quizzes and exams are open book. You can use any and all non-human resources during it. But only, uh, but you're only allowed to. If, so basically, the only humans you can at, turn to to help or uh, receive help from are the TAs and the professor. So quizzes are short assessments. Once started, must be completed within the allotted time. They have a due date and can be started at any time prior to that due date. Makes sense. So say that we give a quiz. I, I assign you a quiz, and it is due. Oh, let's say the twenty of uh, the evening of the 29th. Let's say. It's due 9 p.m. on Friday, next Friday. In that case, you're allowed to start at any time you want before then. Make sense? Um, the final exam, these are completely unsupervised. Um, but I mean, it, it's an honor code thing, mainly because it's, an, it's basically on your honor. And I understand that, yes, there were people who, who you know, abuse that, but it's not a it's not a way to get an honest assessment of your of your grade. Uh, exams are supervised, but I'm not using proctorio or anything. I'm just there to answer questions. Um, the only exam that that really comes down to is the final exam, which I'll discuss in more detail. Um, 
with quizzes and stuff and with it being open book and open re non-human resources, let me discuss what that means in a bit more detail before I discuss the late, the late policy. I have this um, Harvard CS50 course, which I've grabbed a lot of stuff from, had this great policy, which it says that academic honesty is best to, is basically be reasonable. Um, we, I recognize that the that in that talking with other people is the best way to learn. And in fact, I am a big believer that the best way to learn something is to be able to teach it to other people. You only truly master something when you can explain it to somebody else. But that there's a line between getting help from other person and then submitting the work. So all the work you submit to this course in non-group assignments and exams must be your own. You can collaborate and it's encouraged so long as it doesn't mean that somebody's doing your work for, uh, to you. If you think you, here's a bunch of rules of thumbs that I've got that I'm about to go down, uh, uh, go over. And if you think you've made an infraction, then I have a, um, then I have a clause that so long as you tell me within 72 hours of that infraction, I will, I will basically be much more uh, lenient with the way that that turns out. So reasonable talking. Uh, with your classmates about the assignments in English or some other language, including Klingon, Elvish, and Esperanto. Uh, discussing the course materials with others. Doesn't matter if they're in the course or not. Helping a classmate identify a bug. So if somebody says, hey, I don't know. Here, look at my code. I don't know what's going on. You are allowed to look at their code and modify it. Okay? Even if it's on your own computer, right? Uh, taking a couple lines of code uh, from online, like I need a for loop that basically does this specific thing, right? Generally, there, there's for some things, there's like one great way to do things. And provided them, so, so long as the lines that you grab are not solutions themselves to the problem, like it doesn't solve the whole thing, and that you cite where it comes from, uh, and citing is easy in this course, by the way, you're, you can copy something from online. The big thing about plagiarism is, is basically saying, this work is mine when it's really not. As long as you cite it, we avoid that problem, okay? So how do you cite something? Where did you find it? It's on a URL somewhere. Uh, put the URL in what we call a comment. We'll get into what comments are, um, but, so long, eh, but that's all you need to do. It's not like APA or MLA. It's literally just, where did you get this from? Sending or showing code that you've written to someone, possibly a classmate, so they can, uh, so that they can help you identify a bug in your code. Note here that you're sending code, you're sending your incomplete code to somebody else to help you fix it. Sharing a few lines of your code online so that somebody can help you figure out what's going on. Asking on the web, like Stack Overflow, putting stuff on a whiteboard working with and paying a tutor to help you so long as they don't do it for you. So what's not allowed? Uh, grabbing a solution from like Chegg or something and, you know, and saying it's your own. Uh, asking a classmate to, hey, you've solved this, right? Yeah. Can I see your answers? No, that's not good. Uh, decompiling, deobfuscating, or disassembling solutions to problem sets. This is less for this class and more for stuff in Java. Uh, failing to cite, uh, if you copy something, even if it's a small snippet, and you don't cite it, even is is a is a is a violation here, and that's one that I had issues with with last semester. Finding code online that addresses a question on exam and failing to cite it would violate this policy. Finding code online that you think might address the problem at hand and blindly copying it into the exam when it doesn't actually address the question is a great way to violate the policy and to make me angry. It's like the one way to make me angry where you, where basically you, where you think it's gonna do what you think it's gonna do and just, and you just blindly copy it. It's very dangerous to just blindly copy stuff without understanding what it's gonna do. Uh, paying somebody to do your work for you uh, showing your solution to somebody uh, when they when it is they who are having issues, right? So again, sharing your answers with somebody else when you've got a complete solution and somebody else doesn't. Um, you two people having solutions and and you know 
person, let's say Alice and Bob show each other their own solutions, but both have finished it before they showed, that's okay. I think that's more of a gray area, but I'm gonna lean on that's okay, right? It's where you're giving, where you're giving the answer to somebody else, that's not okay. Submit if, and possibly modifying the work of another person beyond the few lines that you, you know, that we, that we talked about, like a small bug. So um, that's really it. Um, I cite that some stuff came from this link in my own syllabus, so there. Um, you have rights. You should check them out. They're listed in the PDF. Um, that's really it for the syllabus. Any questions before I, before I actually start getting into interesting things? So uh, what exactly is demoing? Uh, I don't know if we'll get to it later, but. Okay, oh, demoing. So right after you submit something, right, demoing and late policy. So um, I skipped over those. So demoing, how do you demo? Well, first thing, you, uh, first thing, right? Let's say you've got an assignment. Let's say you've got the first assignment, which is gonna be on, 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 um, let's see, lab one, right? Let's say we've got this assignment, right? Um, let me turn on student view for a second, right? So here is lab one, here's the PDF. First step is submitting. You just simply submit your files as um, whatever files you have and click the submit button, right? And the next thing you do is either during the office hours which you can schedule or during the lab you can uh you can you can show me what you did essentially basically you run the code for me i ask you questions and then i put in your grade which is generally 100 okay as long as you did all the parts of it you'll be able to get 100 on everything pretty much okay um if you're not able to explain it i'll tell you to go away until you can so um so, so it's not something to really be too panicky about. Yes, Rachel. Um, if for some reason everything or like something happens and it doesn't work when we de demo it, would we be able to go back and fix whatever? Yes. It was? In fact, we encourage you to demo early. We encourage you to demo early um, because then we can tell you uh, that there's a mistake. It's very common that that happens. Okay. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, I, 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 um, I was wondering when you said, uh, how many textbooks are there? And, um, there's one textbook, but there's, uh, but there's two other texts, which are good introductory texts that are also fr free. I don't use them in class, but some other students, but sometimes students want other stuff to read or other, or need hard copies. Make I sense? See. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Tom. So when I was trying to get the textbook and on uh, RuneStone and everything, when I was making my um, my profile, I was able to access the um, textbook, but I never put in, I wasn't able to find any place to put in a code. So I ah. don't know if I'm able to be like, because like I have the textbook up, but I right, don't know right. if it's like what I need and Let's I don't go. know if I'm connected or not without Let me having put in the code. I'll walk through, let me walk through that actually once I'm okay. done. Once, what kind of question, once I'm done answering these questions about demoing and I go over the late policy, I'll go over the runestone stuff, okay? So what kind of questions will you be asking after we demo? Uh, that is a good question. Um, it really depends on, on that one. My most common question is the most, what is the, uh, the part that gave you the biggest challenge? Or, um, but for some problems I'll have like, can you explain this specific part to me? Um, so um, it really depends on, on, on the assignment. But my most common question is, uh, will you do the demo after you, sub after you submit? The submit just simply means when it's, uh, lets us know when it's late or not. Generally, even if you're demoing after the due date, we let you go back and fix it if there's an issue. Okay, the, de the, the reason I have you submit is so that there's a paper trail in case there's a network issue where we put in the grade and it doesn't get, and it doesn't take for some reason, right? So we want a paper trail of your code. Make sense?
Okay. Late penalties. So this may make more sense when I talk about the late penalty. Now, again, the late penalty is based off of when you submit it, not when you demo it. So um, the late penalty is as follows. So it is five points per day late with a maximum penalty of 50 points. So you can always turn it in late. Um, in general, uh, though, uh, after two weeks after the due date, unless you, uh, that will be the, um, that's when we kind of say we're not taking any more demos. So you have two weeks until after the due date to demo your lab. And this is because we would just get a lot of students at the end of the semester who were demoing their entire, uh, their entire uh, year's worth of work and doing terrible at it because they hadn't basically participated because they were only doing it at the end. However, this policy is very, we're, we're pretty lenient about because, um, so if you need, if you're having issues, you know, just send me an email because it's an interesting time. You know, you're working from home, stuff can happen. Just, and, and just let me know what's going on and I'll be able to accommodate you on both, on both claw, on either clause. Right. So in general, if you don't have an excuse uh, there, then you have up to two weeks after the due date to demo your lab. Okay. If you've got an excuse, then what, then it's fine. Okay. For quizzes, I have a different late penalty. Uh, for the quizzes, final project and final exam, I have a very, you know, these are more timed exercises. So I have a pretty lenient policy on these. Uh, you're penalized at the rate of 0.1% per minute. So say you're taking the final exam and you need an extra half hour. That costs you three points. That's fairly reasonable. Um, if you're an hour late on a quiz or an exam, congratulations. It's uh, six points off. 16 hours late is about where it just becomes zero. So. Um, in general, we're strict about late exams and quizzes. So unless you have a reason that you did, you know, a specific reason, I won't really be able to accommodate those. Okay. Now let's go ahead and take a look at RuneStone. Okay. So uh, the way RuneStone works, let's go ahead and uh, log out. So I'm going to sign up for RuneStone. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create a username. Um, I'm going to call it Mr. Demo uh, 1051. Right, so here is from RuneStone Academy. The way I got here, by the way, was um, I hit the sign up button up here. This brought me to this page, right? Mr. Demo, I then put in my name, which is going to be, let's say, um, let's call it Dan Demo. Dan.demo at temple.edu. Sorry if that's your name. Put in, create your own username and password. Check this bo a box. Okay. Um, and then here's where you put in the course name. Spring. Uh, temp spring 2021 Rosen. That's the course name we use and just hit sign up. Make sense? Okay. So that's the code I say, uh, that's what I meant with the code, right? Registration for in the HIDS in the field course name, please use the course name your instructor gave you, right? Don't check this because it will try to make the course then, but the course is already made, right? And making a course doesn't give you access to anything more than, uh, than it won't give you access to anything useful. Let's just say, you think it might be useful, but uh, it would require you to know what you need to learn in order to really use it, uh, use it to get any answers out of it. So, okay. So let me, once you are registered, I'm gonna go ahead and log in. Hit log in, select the course you're registered for. As you can see, I've done quite a number, so, here, just click on the one we just signed up for, Spring 2021 Rosen. 
and you'll have this list of stuff, a bunch of project lists, which we will work through as we go through the as uh, in our lectures. Um, and then here's our table of contents of stuff. Also of note is that if you go over here to assignments, you'll have a way of, you know, you'll can see what assignments I have uh, specified for this class. And so here, for instance, is a list of all the readings, which essentially to, to do a reading, all you have to do is participate and mark it as completed once you've finished reading it and it will get automatically graded. Okay. Sit so score me and the score will most likely update. So an important thing to know about score me, it doesn't actually register what your score it is. It will just tell you what your score will be when I run the grader, right? It's a way of seeing what questions you got right and wrong, right? As opposed to it being uh, something that it tells you what you got right and wrong versus telling you what um, versus actually telling you like what your final grade is. Okay. Um, it's a if you have issues with runestone, let me know. I understand it's new, it's different, but any difficulty if you're running into difficulties, just remember I couldn't be making you pay for stuff. And that's, uh, <laughs> so I hope you'll be a bit forgiving then. I, I really like it. The content is really good. It has some really good videos with it. Um, it's backed by a really good people. A couple of features that are really useful here are um, the fact that you have, that the code examples are runnable, right? You can run the these bits of code and modify these bits of code. Second, if for some reason you find yourself on a computer that you can't install Python on, which we will talk, and the first lab is all about getting Python up and running on your computer, by the way. So if you, that's okay. But if for some reason you don't have access to Python, hit this handy, this handy pen button right here. And now you have access to a Python interpreter. So here I can write the most basic Python program there is called hello world, which just Tell, says to the computer, please say hello to me. Say hello to the world, in fact. Hello, world. Save and run it. And boom. And there. It runs just fine. So even if, so for some reason, if your computer is having issues that with Python, you can always use this for doing Python. Um, okay, let's see. I think I need to check my chat because I, I realize I'm not seeing the window here. Okay, great. No extra questions. Okay. Um, any more questions about RuneStone? Yeah, I have a question. Um, for module one, when we go to like the chapter one readings, it also has a uh, chapter eight on there. Do you want to complete those as well or just the chapter one? Where, let me see, um, is on Canvas or on RuneStone? Like when you go to like Canvas and you click on module one and you click on chapter one readings and. Okay, let me see. Uh, because there probably shouldn't be something from module eight, but hey, I will check it out. I remember there being something early on so, so let me go to modules. And so module one overview. Right, module one overview. And then the chapter one readings. Okay. And then you click the chapter one readings again. The ah, okay, yes. I should have removed, here, let me go and fix that. I don't know why those got there. Instructor page, watch this. Assignments. Chapter one readings, visible to student readings. Why are you there? Remove those. Save. There you go, fixed. Also would for the, would you want us to complete the chapter assessments for on there? No, only what I, uh, the only exercises you need to do are the ones that are listed in the exercises. Okay. Because for some reason there's a bunch of exercises from other chapters just stored there. 
So only only worry about the things I I tell you to do. Sounds good. Like from here. So all right. Other questions. All right, so with the last 25 minutes or so, I'm going to go and talk about a brief history of the history of computer science, which first means that I need to actually define what is computer science. Any, any takers on that one? Furiously uh, typing computer science into Wikipedia's look, uh, page. Computer science have to do with the under understanding of networking. It does. That's a part of it. I'm actually going to check what computer science uh, Wikipedia says about uh, computer science. Like I, um, understanding like programming and how computers work and uh, yeah. That is a part of it. Although we don't actually have to have computers to do computer science. A bit of a misnomer. Um, for instance, uh, it's it's computer science is actually a poorly named uh, is a poorly named field. It's like if I called astronomy telescope science, you know, or biology microscope science. It's just something that is poorly named. Lovelace did uh, was the first programmer um, by so or at least widely considered to be the first. Uh, recorded uh, programmer. So let's go ahead and just define it for you. There's, you can ask a bunch of computer scientists what their definitions in are, and they'll give you a bunch of different answers. Uh, but in general, it is what I, what we call the uh, study of algorithms. And that's our, what I'll say is the not wrong answer. Um, in fact, let, I have a PDF of this stuff. So um, it doesn't, the science of it doesn't actually have to do too much with computers. That's more the engineering side. It's not programming. That's an understandable misconception. And in fact, it's a misconception I had when I joined a computer science because our first computer exposure to computer science is all about learning a programming language. But it isn't all about learning programming languages. Uh, Computer science kind of had started in its nascent infancy as a branch of mathematics long before computer science did. And it's kind of this uh, weird, honestly, it's like the Balkans, just a bunch of uh, different fields that are grouped together and just waiting to be split apart until, but until somebody figures out the best way to do it, stuck. So um, besides, the time, the time you get your degree, by the way, you're going to be getting a lot of new programming languages. Uh, you can you can pick up a I can pick up a new programming language in about two weeks if I really dedicate myself to it. Um, it's not nearly as hard as learning a new language. Um, so, uh, I like the algorithm from the textbook of Gibbs and Tucker. Like I said, it's the study of algorithms, and it is a science because we're studying essentially. How do we alt automate problem solving? We're asking, and the fundamental question it asks is, what, when you get right down to it, can we automate? What can be done automatically by a machine or by a computer? And what can we efficiently automate? And what does even efficiency mean? And that depends on the context. Uh, if you're working on one of these, um, on one, with one of these handheld computers right over here, then efficiency does mean that uh, that that we have to be efficient with our energy usage. But on this guy sitting in front of me, plugged into a wall, ah, who cares about energy efficiency? I can draw as much energy as I need. Um, just one branch of computer science, the more theoretical side says, quote, covers a wide variety of topics, including algorithms, data structures, computational complexity, parallel and distributed computation, probabilistic computation, quantum computation, automata theory, information theory, cryptography, program, semantics, and verification. What is that? Oh, 
machine learning, computational biology, computational economic, computational geometry, computational number theory, and algebra. It's often distinguished by its emphasis on mathematical technique and rigor. Quite a uh, definition there, but but again, computer science is what I what we refer to as the study of algorithms. That means that we're uh, studying what algorithms. Uh, we're just studying the behavior of algorithms. In other words, making sure they're they're correct, uh, designing uh, and building computer systems that can execute algorithms, designing programming languages to translate these algorithms into stuff that the hardware can actually run. So um, what can you do with computer science? Um, and this is my spiel for you to take it to get a certificate or a minor if you're considering that, which is that um, it's it teaches you two things. Uh, it teaches you how to program and how to problem solve. Given a problem, you know how to, you know how to think about a problem, and take it apart. It's got a, um, the the programming is all about problem solving. So it's not just limited to software development, uh, biology, chemistry, and medicine have huge applications with computer science. Bioinformatics, bio, um, medical com uh, computation, that's big right now. And it was big even before the pandemic, right? This was a line I wrote before the pandemic. Um, the bioinformatics, all about, that is the cross section between biology and computer science. And that is kind of lives in that gray area between biology and chemistry. Uh, being able to write algorithms to help come up with uh, treatments to detect cancer, design of new medicines, uh, analyzing a se genetic sequences to create HIV inhibitors. Uh, if you want to get more uh, cyberpunky, prosthetics, right? Um, those are definitely kind of things. I mean, come on, the ability, you know, we're talking about, we, we put devices in people now so that they can, that, because that's a better alternative than, than keeping whatever organs they had. Um, you know, human hands are getting bet, uh, you know, replacing somebody's hand with a robotic hand is getting easier. Um, let's see, physics and astronomy. So there's the entire f confusing field of quantum computing. As far as astronomy st uh, comes with, most of supernovas that we detect these days in the sky are detected automatically by computer programs. Um, there's tons of astronomy data that that's going to be need to be analyzed. The Large Synoptic te uh, Survey Telescope, about that's about 140 terabytes of data a day to be analyzed. Um, engineering, engineering, computer science go hand in hand. It's all about constructing things, uh, constructing things to help solve problems. Business and economics, team management. Big one though is high speed out uh, trading algorithms. Most trading cap uh, happens with uh, it happens electronically these days, um, and is done by programs. Uh, if you if 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 your goal is to make is to accrue as much money as possible, learn learn the stuff that's needed for high speed uh, tr high speed algorithmic trading and get a job at one of the at one of those large finance companies or a bank. That's 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 the that's the money route. Psychology, um, the crossover uh, of psychology and computer science has this entire field called human computer interaction, which is all about how do people use computers, and how can we design computers so that you know they aren't terrible or less so at least. Um, one of my favorite places was where I actually got started in research and got into my taste into academia, which was in a psychology lab that was all about creating user interfaces and acoustical maps for blind users. Um, computer science and education. I mean, how many of us played Oregon Trail of, or Oregon Trail or some variation of it? Education on computers is a, you know, the, the field of edutainment is huge. Cybersecurity is, I'm talking, so, yeah, cybersecurity is all about, um, these are like crossovers with computer science. And that's not talking about, when, if we're talking about direct applications of computer science, you know, there's software engineering, there's networking, there's data analysis, and there's security. Software engineering is just straight up building software solutions. Um, so 
to begin our history, uh, let's talk about what an algorithm is, that magical word that I have yet to define. And, believe, and I understand I have not defined it, so I will go ahead and define it. So the word algorithm comes from the lionized name for the Persian mathematician, uh, Mohammed Ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, which I probably butchered. Um, it was Latinized into uh, algorithm. Um, but this guy wrote a book, a textbook in 820, um, which the title gets translated to the Concise Book of Calculation by Reduction. And uh, from that title, we get the word uh, algebra or algebra, which was the word reduction. So he's the guy you can blame for algebra. So um, he also wrote a book containing how, how to do instruction, uh, mathematical operations of these new uh, new 10 digit systems, come, or sorry, these new base 10 systems, these Indian decimal systems that had just come up. So he wrote a book on how you do, on how you do operations with, uh, with you know modern numbers essentially, as opposed to like those awful Roman numerals. The book was eventually translated into Latin and it got spread across Europe um, because the dark ages is kind of a myth. So um, the algorithm, so, so what is an algorithm that we named this guy for? Well, we named him after doing these kind of mathematical operations. So starting algor studying algorithms kind of began in mathematics Right, you know some algorithms. Anytime where you do uh, addition and multiplication by hand, you're using an algorithm there. Right, anytime where we're adding on things like, oh, let's say, let's see, do I still have my pen over here? It fell on the floor again, of course. So let's go ahead and open up the whiteboard. Right, so got it, boom new, let's create a new whiteboard over here. Okay, and let's go ahead and increase the pen size. So, right, if I tell you to add uh, 476 to, and I'm just making this up here, to 87, right? We follow an algorithm, right? We follow a specific process to solve this, which is, as everybody knows, six plus seven, is equal to 13, but you can't write 13 here. So you take the one and carry it over here. Then you do seven plus eight, which is seven plus eight is 15. So we add one to that from the carry 16 and carry the one, one plus five plus zero is equal to five. So we get 563. So we followed an algorithm there. Okay, so what exactly is an algorithm? Okay, an algorithm is a set of well-ordered, unambiguous operations which yield some result in a finite amount of time. That's a, that's a mouthful, so let's describe that. So well-ordered, that means that the steps you do have a specific order that will not vary, right? So when, for instance, when we did this algorithm of addition over here, we started at the ones place, like we learned in, el in elementary school. Then we did the tens place, then we did the hundreds place. Every operation we did was well ordered, right? It had a specific order. Unambiguous operations. I didn't tell you to, um, I didn't tell you to take six and seven and plus squiggly, T them, right? I told you to add them. They're, they're, they're unambiguous operations. I will put this PDF on the canvas for you, okay? There's a lot of stuff in this that I'm not gonna bother going over because this was intended, uh, because I just kept adding to this at some point <laughs> and it was, there's a lot of irrelevant stuff in here as well, but I will um, add it so, uh, to the canvas. So, um, but it is a well-ordered, unambiguous operations, meaning the, the, there's no ambiguity in what's going to go on, right? There's no possible way to misinterpret stuff. It yields some result. The algorithm does something. It doesn't just do nothing, right? It does something. So set of well-ordered, it has an order, 
unambiguous, meaning there's no room for misinterpretation, yields some result in a finite amount of time. My favorite algorithms, by the way, are those that produce chocolate chip cookies. That's right. Well-written recipes are algorithms. So, um, so, a, you know, and if we were in person and I had thought about this a bit more, I would have brought in chocolate chip cookies, but we are not, and alas, our loss. It is yet an, another thing that coronavirus has robbed from you. So, the, um, but it results in a finite amount of time. It doesn't go on forever. It's going to end at some point. Okay. So what's the difference between an algorithm and a, pro and a program? An algorithm is something like this, where we kind of just write it out and, and, and describe the process. We describe it in a well-ordered, unambiguous way, but it's not a, but it's a way for other humans to others understand. It's not necessarily a program. A program is an implementation of an algorithm. Make sense, right? You take an algorithm, you turn it into program, and it allows computers to automate that task. Okay. So um, there are four basic. Uh, there was a couple of in, in a bunch of people um, came up with. Uh, a, these huge insights of computer science, which is that um, all information, and notice that it's Bacon, Leibniz, Boole, Turing, Shannon, Morse, all information that, that we want to express, we can translate that to zero and ones, okay? Uh, you can represent those zeros and ones with any two distinct, easily distinguishable states like high and low vo voltage or on and off. But the idea here is you can represent information as zeros and ones. You just got to have a way of translating that because I don't understand zeros and ones. Um, Turing had a uh, big insight was what we call the Turing machine. Um, independently, um, let's see, one second. I want to make sure I get the name right. And, uh, and that came across, uh, oh yeah, church. Alonzo Church. Uh, and this came across, and this is much more famous than the uh, similar thing done by Alonzo Church, uh, who created something called Lambda Calculus, which expresses the same, uh, so much of the same context. The idea was is that you could, uh, that all algorithms can be done using only five actions. You imagine you have this long strip of paper evenly divided into squares. And you have a moving device that can basically do one of five things. It can move left along this line of paper, right along this line of paper, zero, one. It can write that on the square that it's currently at, or it can erase the square. And if that doesn't make sense, it, that's okay. It doesn't become amazing until you take like a 4,000 level class that's completely optional. But the but basically what this meant is that essentially this became the mathematical model you can use for a computer. That's what makes Turing very famous. So what other famous things happened in computer science? Um, well, we kind of started with the abacus, which was not really a computer itself. The human was the computer, but the abacus was the way we did, we kind of extended our ability to count, added more data storage. Um, but around the 1600s, this was kind of where the birth of computer science started, which was that we had this idea that a lot of people, Pascal, Leibniz, Babbage, they all had this idea of creating this these automatic machines that could do operations that, um, and you could make them out of gears, all the rage then, gears. Um, you'd use, and the way it would work is that the gears would turn and you'd use whatever way they ended up uh, to represent the numbers. And so Babbage, what he specifically wanted to do was create a gear-based machine to print out. The, the, the idea was is that it would do the operation, but honestly, trying to look at all the gears and figure out what number went to which one. Wait, is this one seven or five? I don't know what that one is, right? Figure that out. Figuring that out was difficult. So he said, I just want to be able to print that output on paper. So that brings us to our first programmer, um, which is uh, Augusta Ada uh, 
Augusta Ada King, Countess of Lovelace, also uh, often referred to as uh, Ada Lovelace. Uh, she is the first programmer. Um, she is famous and she, and it is impressive that she is famous for being a programmer, considering she's not famous for who her for who her father was. Any 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 takers on that one? Uh, her father was the English writer Byron, uh, who's who was well known, who was basically a literary rock star of the time. Um, and he was so outrageous that basically his, that her mother basically said, yeah, we're not gonna study any of those literary stuff because I don't want that Byron blood coming out and turning you into this rambunctious person. And so basically she was directed completely towards the mathematics. But, um, and she turns out she excelled there. So uh, what happened was is that ba Babbage was designing this analytical engine. Um, he designed it, but never was able to produce it. Uh, the idea would take instructions from a paper card with hunt uh, holes punched in them, like a jacquard uh, loom. Um, and the idea here was that Ada published what helped him with that, helped write a, publish a paper about that. And as part of that, she wrote a program the first program showing how that uh, analytical engine could be set up to produce this Bernoulli, the, uh, some uh, sequence of, it could compute the sequence of numbers called Bernoulli numbers, which are useful statistical numbers. So she, again, this was never even produced, but she basically wrote a program for this theoretical machine. Um, but what's kind of big for her was that she wrote about how a machine could such as the analytical engine, how this machine could be used to work on things other than numbers, like say words. And that thought was like a hundred years ahead of its time. Sadly, she was, uh, she was taken from the world at a very early age from, by cancer. World War II was basically the next big um, acceleration in computer science. That was the birth of modern cryptography, um, which was using machines, or rather it was the birth of modern cryptography to using machines to uh, create ciphers and modern cryptanalysis using machines to break ciphers. Um, the German, this was most notably, if you've seen the imitation game, then this talks about the about information that was classified as ultra, which was anything that came from uh, from intercepting and tr and cracking German codes. So um, anything that was cracked from Japanese code was called magic. So if you had ultra magic clearance, you were made sure to stay well away from the front uh, because you're in because you knew too you knew too much. Um, the most famous of the code breakers at Bletchley Park was Alan Turing. Um, he was extre an extremely famous, and I should mention, uh, the Imitation Game uh, movie does make him to be less personable than he actually was in real life. He was actually got along quite well with his team and was actually much happier than, he, than, uh, than, than it w made him out, out to be. But regardless, he... he he and his team constructed what was called a bomb to um, help decrack the Nazi codes. Uh, the cracking of the Nazi codes was aided by basically being able to cipher stuff, uh, reports that were always the same. So uh, I was gonna get into that. So um, the, so for instance, uh, if you have like, if you have a report, if you have a something you're trying to crack, a code you're trying to crack, but you know what it's going to turn out as, that helps you crack other codes. So, for instance, there was always there was, for instance, you got an output uh, output post in the war where nothing's happened and you're intercepting the message, nothing to report. Congratulations, you have something to help you use. Also, Germans would always sign off with Heil Hitler, which lets you know what the last words of the message were almost always. 
So it made it very, that also helped cra uh, crack things. Um, Eisenhower, uh, who was the Supreme Allied Commander, said that Ultra was decisive to an Allied victory. He estimated, don't know how he did it, but his estimate was that it cut down the war by two years. Um, sadly, uh, Alan Turing was gay and in a time where being gay was unacceptable. So um, he was arrested for homosexuality and he was given the choice between, um, well, I think it was prison and chemical castration. He chose chemical castration and then he eventually committed suicide. Yeah, fun story. Um, the, gov the, the UK government recently issued an apology, but damage kind of there is kind of done. Um, again, a very, a, a person, you know, a brilliant computer scientist, you know, dying at an early age, a trend, fortunately, that has not really continued. Um, there's, after that, there's a lot of contentious, what is the first computer? There's no clear first computer. Everybody has their own, uh, own opinions. A famous early computer is ENIAC, the Electrical Numerical Integrator and Computer. Here you go. Note the, uh, note the woman, by the way. Um, note the year. Construction began in 1943, completed in 1946. Men were off fighting at the front. So women were working, were, were doing the electronic work. So um, it used vacuum tubes, 1800 square feet, and it was primarily used to aid with artillery calculations. Um, since then, the story of computers has been miniaturization. IBM introduced the first PCs in 1982. Um, then the computers continued to get smaller and smaller to the point where you can fit them in your pocket. Um, after that, the next big thing has been globalization. Um, the internet, which is the global system of network computers and the most popular applic application on the internet, which is the World Wide Web. Basically, that's what you get when you um, go into the uh, go to the web and type www. Um, that has the internet is so large that it requires um, things called search engines to find what exists on the internet, like Google. Um, so, how do you become a good programmer? Does it require natural chat talent? It can help, but eventually you're going to hit a wall if you just rely on natural talent. No, the way you become a good programmer is practice. It's like asking how does somebody become a good musician? I'm a terrible musician. I got a minor in music actually. I'm terrible, I'm a terrible music player. Uh, but, uh, and the reason I, I never got any better is because they didn't practice. Practicing is how you become better. What makes you a good, a excellent programmer is doing more work now so that you can be lazy in the future. That is the mindset I've found that all good programmers have, um, which is that basically it says, okay, I could do this task like of sending the, like sending the initial username and their initial password to all my hundred students. Um, Ryan, I do not care what, uh, what you use to do your, uh, to write your code in. I will talk more about that on Thursday. Okay. Um, but like I could, you know, send out the username and, and initial login password to all my students, send out one email at a time, you know, or I can spend twice as much time right now so I don't have to do it again in the future. And actually I have an email that does, I have a program, Python program that does just that uh, because that was something I did. You want to be, basically programmers are all about being uh, lazy in a very smart way. So, um, but again, how do you get good at be, uh, being doing music? You practice, same thing with computer science. And that's why I give you these homeworks and these assignments to help you practice. So 
again, how do you install Python and stuff like that? I'll just, since it's being mentioned in the chat, I'll briefly mention here. If you go to your modules, you can either, you can either click modules or start here, right? If you click start here, you can go through the modules this way. Hit next, right? And keep going. Um, module one overview, next installing Python. And I've got videos on how you install Python. And then if you're working on a Chromebook or an iPad or other low powered computer, right? Thank you for sending the link, Stephen. Um, you can find that stuff here. Uh, all module stuff can be accessed from a, like a top down level over here, right? Here I talk about this first week up through Monday is all about getting Python installed on your computer and making sure we can run it. That's really all we're doing. After that, we'll start learning how to program with variables and stuff. In other words, this is gonna be the kind of stuff that might help you aid you in, in starting to do your uh, other homework in, in classes like physics or calculus. Is there a spec requirement? I can't say if there is or not. There shouldn't really, if you've got a computer that can, that's running Zoom, you can probably run Python. <laughs> GTX Titan. <laughs> That's cruel. Um, but the, um, but um, if you, again, if you have, if you're, if you can't install Python or there's issues with that, then there's a bunch of web-based resources. One is the textbook. It has a Python editor built in. Another is CS50 IDE, which is an IDE all required, completely free. All you need is a, is a GitHub account. And basically it's an online based IDE. It saves your work from computer to computer so long as you log in. And basically you can do all your programming from a web browser. So, um, if you're using a, if you're, and you'll be able to install regardless of whether you're on Mac or PC. So, um, and I'll be talking about the different solutions that we have. Um, and again, I'll go over this on, I'll go over this again on Thursday, but I don't really have a strong opinion one way or another of what you use to program. I'll start out using idle because it's built because it comes packaged with Python, but I'll be using VS code after that. Um, there's a lot you can you you can use a uh, sublime text is another good one. All right, now before I sign off again, I will be streaming on discord on around six o'clock. I'll most likely be um, uh, uh, it will most likely be be my son playing uh, uh, an electronic version of Ticket to Ride, but um, we'll see what happens. So, um, if you have questions about PC and PC building, by the way, um, I have, you know, that's actually something. If you need hardware recommendations, we do have a channel for that in um, in Discord. I. Uh, Yes, I am a gamer, I guess. Um, I don't really like the label too much, but I play video games. Um, I play a lot of Stellaris, Hearts of Iron. These days I've been playing a lot of Dragon Quest on Switch. Um, I was a big fan of the Dark Souls series. Um, so yeah, I don't play too many I do not play too many uh, first-person shooters. The only first-person shooter I really play is uh, is Killing Floor Two, um, and a lot of the PC gaming I do these days is on um, this guy. All right, so that's it for our first lecture. Uh, I will be. Ha I look forward to seeing you guys you all guys and gals on Thursday. So um, let me go uh, ahead. I have a question before we leave. Yes. Um, it's about the lecture one. Um, are we gonna start, are we gonna, is that for us to do by ourselves, or can I ask for help on? Um... That will be, um, the lecture one st uh, stuff will most likely be um, done on Thursday.
Oh, or yeah, Project I, One. I see. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. All right. If you have any other questions, feel free to stick around and ask them. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to stop recording. Gotcha. Thank you.